Thank you very much, Brittany, for this wonderful and not nasty at all introduction. So, talking about nasty test input. Let's start with testing all along. We have a client, we have a server. Let's assume they both speak the SSL, TLS, heartbeat protocol, and then we have a client that sends a payload to the server, and we have the server that replies to things. You probably have seen this as part of um, the well-known heartbleed vulnerability, but we're not going to talk about that today anyway. The important thing is that the payload that is being sent and that is to the server and the payload that the server responds must be identical, and then the client knows the server is still alive. Now, suppose you have such a service, very simple thing, and you want to test that this works. Well, what do you do? You need to craft a number of inputs, more inputs and even more inputs, possibly testing corner cases and whatnot. And, well, you also need to check whether the server is actually good, going to do the right thing. So you also need to specify a number of outputs and check that the inputs actually get the right outputs and everything. This is testing as we know it. This is testing as we all of us have done. And yeah, we do it all day long and it's boring and it's, and it's boring, and but it does the job. Yeah, yeah, we do that. But I want today, I want to talk about how to create such inputs. So let's go for a simple approach here. Let's go and create some random inputs. So I'm throwing a dice and I'm just throwing random bytes at my server. This is called fuzzing. It can be arbitrarily smart. And if you're lucky, well, in our case, one out of 200, 256 messages will actually be correct and possibly get you a reply. But in most cases, nothing is going to happen because the server is simply going to say, uh, this is not a valid message. And anyway, after a couple of attempts, you'll probably be locked out because you sent too many illegal requests to the server anyway. So here you, here you go. So what else can we do? I want to talk to you today how you can become, how you can become a testing superhero. A testing superhero by creating a robot, a robot that will automatically do the right thing, namely sending inputs that are correct to the server and also check whether the outputs are correct and then you can finally relax. How can we do that? Well, you could go and program such a robot, that would be one way, but then you have to program such a robot for every new, every, every new server, everything you look at, and that's, oh, yeah, that's well, yeah, you can do that, it's not fun either. No. What we do here is we leverage languages, and we're not talking programming languages, but we are talking formal languages. Did I just say the word formal? Please stay with us for a moment. Um, and, and I know you have, if you've studied computer science, maybe you learned formal languages, didn't like it. Wait, wait a moment. It's all super useful. Because if you have a formal language, um, in our case, for instance, a grammar, then you can specify what the what the input to the server should be. So it's uh, zero X one followed by a length, a payload and a padding, and what the reply should be in abstract form. So server sends back zero X two length and that payload and padding. And these are things that you can actually specify in a grammar that describes the correct format of such interactions. And if you have such a grammar, then, well, you still need to check that the payload is identical. But you also, well, grammar alone is not enough because the problem here also is you have things in these interactions that you also need to satisfy. For instance, the length field that you see up here has actually, actually has to be identical, it has to actually be um, the exact length of the payload that follows. And these are things that you cannot easily express in a grammar. What we do is, therefore, first we fuse these two things together, the uh, request and the response in a single grammar. But then we do something um, very nice because as the syntax alone does not suffice to capture these semantic uh, uh, relationships between individual elements, we add extra constraints to the input that describe these um, semantic features as, uh, as logical formula. These are logical formula in which the non-terminals, the thing in angle brackets, actually take the role of variables in here. For instance, we can here specify that the, we can for instance specify that the length, which is a 16-bit integer, is actually identical to the length of the payload. And we can even do more. We can also check that the output is correct, for instance, by saying that the payload that we have seen in the client request is identical to the payload that the server responds. 
And this is what we have uh, built in a language called Isla, which is both a language to specify such inputs and outputs by means of grammars and constraints. But it's also more than that. It's also a fuzzer and a solver to produce valid inputs that satisfy all these constraints. And it's also a checker that helps you to parse and check and mutate inputs following all these constraints. And it is this tool that, well, is one of the tools that can make you a superhero. Let me show you how this actually works. So here's Isla working. So what, we, what Isla does is it uses the grammar uh, for producing exchanges or for producing inputs and outputs. So we have an exchange again between the client and the server, client and server, here we have them. And now it uses pretty much standard uh, production techniques, namely takes the, it takes the element on the left-hand side of a rule and replaces this by the elements on the right-hand side of the rule. So an exchange becomes a request and a response. And now we expand the request and now we take the length and we expand the length. And the length is an integer 16-bit. And <clears throat> now we instantiate this, uh, skipping a few things and say, okay, length is five bytes. Now we instantiate the other elements too, such as the payload, for instance. And here's the, where the magic of uh, Isla comes in because Isla automatically satisfies these constraints. So the word hello has five bytes, which happens to be the length. So all of this fits. And now we need to instantiate the padding. Padding is not very interesting. This is just zero bytes. And what we have now is a complete and valid input that satisfies both syntax and semantics. This is something that we can now happily send to the server and the server will then respond with a valid response. And Isla can now go and uh, decompose this response. So again, parse it along the rules of the grammar. So we have a length, we have a payload, we have a padding and it can identify what these elements are. So this is the length and this is the payload and here we have the padding. And now since, we, since Isla knows what the Isla knows what the payload is, then it can actually go and also check whether the output constraint is satisfied. That is whether the, um, hello, whether the payload in the request actually is identical to the payload in the response. So we have a complete exchange here and happily we know that everything works well, life is good, no heart bleed today. And as you see, this solves two problems, two, two big problems, or solves, addresses two problems. One is the problem of test generation, namely generating inputs. And the other one is the problem of oracles, that is checking inputs. Now, all of this is great for you if you are a regular developer. Yes, superhero and everything. But now let's get back to the title. I was talking about nasty inputs, not just your regular vanilla inputs no we're talking we're talking hardcore here okay let's 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 think about something let's think about something that is unusual so i'm going to ask you to morph from a regular friendly person to a somewhat more nasty person here we have the nasty person so this is a super villain and now you not only want to check whether the server is doing well no you want to break the server so you're a penetration tester or something like that okay good of course, this is also your job as a tester to check against that. So what can you do here? Let's go and use our newly found superpowers to create, super, to create buffer overflows. With Isla, this is super easy. You just add another new constraint to that and say, my payload must be at least 100 million bytes long. That should be sufficient to overflow most of the buffers. Not sure whether this is valid though. Well, we can easily find that out. We just synthesize this and we send these 100 million bytes to a server near us and then we'll find out whether it crashes or not. Maybe it's going to crash. Maybe it's going to work. Well, we'll find out, no problem. Or let's go and try to build some SQL injections. We remain nasty here. You've probably heard about SQL injections. So we're simply going to say, okay, the payload must be something like drop table customers and there goes your, there go your customers. So you send 0x1 drop table customers. And now let's assume that these individual interactions are actually being logged in a database. And then you get a command like this into insert log values, payload, and then drop table customers. Boom, you boom, the customer table on your server is gone. Yes, this is the, these are real attacks. This is what happens all along, but now you can actually prevent them by checking them yourself. Or you go, oh, oh yeah, SQL just gone. Or you build HTML injection. Same thing again. You insert some 
you insert some extra some extra HTML elements in here and say, okay, I'm going to introduce some uh, HTML tags. Could also be scripts for that matter. And you know, you send that out. And if this is logged, what's going to happen is that now all of a sudden your log contains HTML elements, which means that the next time you check your log, all of a sudden there will be, will be interactive elements in your log. Say the close button. Now we add a script to that, which steals your password and whatnot, grabs a screenshot of your, of, of your screen, sends your browsing history to whomever. Yep, and these, are all, these are all things that, uh, that attackers can do. And yes, they can also combine all of this. And, but now finally, you actually have a means to, you have a means to combine all of that well, you can, insert, insert, you come up, can come up with a rule for nasty inputs, and my nasty input be a buffer overflow input, SQL injection input, HTML injection input. Yep, all fun. Okay, so what are we doing here? Are we building a weapon for attackers? Uh, yep, it, we're, you see, you can use all these tools as a defendant too, because you can use these tools just as well to see what to see what is possible and to come up with all the creativity in your mind to prevent this from happening in production code. And if you are interested in all these techniques, writing such, um, writing such grammars, testing well, I have two books for you. One is called The Fuzzing Book. The other one is called The Debugging Book. And if you Google them, uh, sorry, are we, are, we, are we Microsoft here? If you Bing them or whatever, if you search them on the internet, you're going to find them, fuzzingbook.org, debuggingbook.org. And with this, I'd like to close how to become a testing superhero, language specifications, nasty inputs, and of course, a... And of course, these two books with a nice QR code that gets you directly to a tutorial. If you're interested in all that, take a screenshot right now. Follow me on, follow me on the Elon Musk network or follow me on the super nice Mastodon network, just as you like. And thank you very much. And I'm happy to close. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. Uh definitely held up your end of the bargain on that one. So really appreciate the engaging presentation. We have a question already. Uh, do want to put out there, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Slack and they will be conveyed and we will pass them along. And even if we don't have the time to do so, we will make sure that you get your answers. You, you can count on it. So one of the questions that we have here is why a new language rather than, for example, having people express constraints in Python or something they already know? Uh, multiple answers. A, grammars are not a new language. Grammars are much older than Python. Actually, Python is specified as a grammar. Second, these constraints is, well, very familiar to anyone who's a program. Third thing, you want a language specification that you can use both for parsing and for producing. And this is something a general purpose like purpose language like Python cannot do, because if you specify a producer, say in Python, that produces inputs, you cannot use it for parsing, you cannot use it for checking, you cannot use it for mutating things. So uh, well, you, you have to build this parser for yourself. You also have to implement all the testing strategies for yourself. And having this in an abstract form allows you to allows you to unlock all these strategies, allows you to reason about your code, and well. And it can even serve as it can even serve as a language independent documentation of what your program actually expects in terms of inputs and what it produces as outputs. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much for that. I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, I do want to ask a quick question about a uh, kind of scalability of this approach so like this is really interesting and the idea of being able to generate inputs that are both valid and invalid with a specification language i think is potentially revolutionary um but can we take this to a more simpler context that isn't server communication are there other ways that we could use this specification to test any of our software systems it doesn't have to be server communication at all. You can replace the server with by any program that takes an input, and then you can send inputs to this very program. This can be your command line input. This can be your, this can be your whatever train, uh, your your train controller, your system thing, whatever. So, um, and you also don't have to necessarily check the output. If you can live without checking the output, then you can also do that. Um, the thing is that if you have a very complex set of constraints then solving all these constraints will take time. So it's going to take a minute or so, or, or maybe even longer. And there will also be programs which, um, for, which test, for which solving these constraints will be impossible. So if you, 